Alright, so welcome to the first in a series of videos on Slavoj Žižek's The Ticklish Subject. Now, this is one of Žižek's greatest works. It is a theoretical work rather than, say, just a work on the stuff that he's known most for in popular imagination, which is uh, jokes and uh, pop culture and current events. Obviously, he does all three in the, in the course of this book, but this is a theoretical work like his other great theoretical works. So it'll deal with German idealism, which means it'll deal with Hegel and therefore Kant, but also with a thinker that nobody wants to touch. And even if these movements within Western and really the global uh, academy are radically opposed to each other, they're at least in agreement about uh, the specter of Cartesianism, which they feel they must repel. And yet the irony is, even though every movement uh, within the academy is against it, nobody's really wanting to espouse it, except, of course, for Zizek, and that movement is Cartesianism. Now, the idea in Descartes, uh, the great philosopher that um, even if I can't be sure that I'm really experiencing what I am right now, I can't be sure that a, an evil genius, and, and that means more like an evil jinn, a spirit rather than a smart person, might be implanting thoughts into my mind to make me hallucinate stuff that's not really in front of me. If, even if that's the case, if I'm doubting, that means I'm thinking, and if I'm thinking, that means that I exist because there must be somebody who's thinking. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Um, people misunderstand that to think that Descartes believed that by thinking he could make himself exist. He was actually working the other way around. He was saying, because I'm thinking, I can deduce from that that th there's somebody that exists. The question is, what kind of thing? And this leads to Cartesian dualism. He talked about there was res extensa, Latin word for like the extended thing, and there was res cogitans, the thinking thing. The extended thing was kind of this, this body which is out there in space and time. Um, as a physical object, but then there was also this other kind of thing which is involved in thinking, and the idea that the mind and the body uh, can be divided in that way is what pretty much every movement is going to oppose. You have even movements against each other like deconstruction and Habermasian, you know, communicative rationalism. Uh, even if they're against each other, Habermas calling deconstruction not only an irrational theory, but something which uses the rules of rational communication to communicate an irrational theory, um, they're still both against Cartesianism. You know, Habermas saying that uh, the Cartesian model of, of, of reason is one thinker thinking rationally is to be opposed to the communicative model of reason, reason as people communicating rationally. Uh, you have the feminist critique that not only is Cartesianism um, uh, the the division between mind and body, but it's also a gendered division. You have masculine reason and you have feminine inner matter. This is a, a Judith Butler argument. You have post-colonial theory, Spivak saying that not only is Western discourse a silencing of the subaltern's ability to speak, but that's also a masculine Western Cartesian discourse. Um, and so many other arguments along the same lines, and yet nobody... They, they all feel the need to attack Cartesianism. Nobody's really espousing it, except um, except Zizek. And in order to do that, he's going to open the book not by dealing with any one of those particular critiques of Cartesianism, but dealing with one of the greatest philosophical uh, critiques of Cartesianism of the 20th century, and that was in Heidegger's Being in Time. Now, the question of being in time is, really, why was it not finished? Now, we all know the official answer that the book outlines um, a series of parts dealing with Kant and Aristotle and Descartes, etc., um, which which were ne was never finished. Um, and yet, in a certain sense, it was, because if you look at Heidegger's lectures, you can find the critique of Kant in his lectures, you can find the critique of, of Aristotle, etc. in his lectures, so we have actually the manuscripts. But there's a certain sense in which it both feels in, it both feels complete. I mean, he did the theoretical work, rather, I mean, it was just the application of it to historical considerations that wasn't added on. But even the final section on historicity feels like it was added on as a supplement. Really, the book itself does have the feel of a finished book. So the question is not so much, why didn't Heidegger finish it? Um, it's the question, why did he abandon it? It was more that he actively abandoned the project of being time. And the official answer to why he abandoned it is, of course, that he still found it to be too subjective and, um, uh, you know, caught up in the Western metaphysics of Cartesianism, whatever. Uh, that's why his later work deals with language and poetry, etc. 
But Zizek is going to make the argument instead that he didn't finish it because in his investigation of Kant in encountering the transcendental imagination, he found something which he had to recoil away from. All right, and therefore, I'd like to do a much larger analysis of being in time than is possible in this video. I'll just give a very short version. Heidegger, and I will do a whole series of videos on it, by the way, but for starters, Heidegger was interested in the question of whether being is a being. Now, we all know what beings are, specific, like, objective entities, which, of course, there's a Western tradition of the categories that can be applied to them, substance, quality, quantity, etc. But what about being itself? And do we need a whole new terminology? Heidegger, Heidegger was very careful to abandon the Western metaphysical terminology that had come down as merely technical terms. Now, he was interested in those in Greek, the way that language really speaks um, in Greek to mean something. When we say substance, in Greek it's really ushia, which is more like the literal term for an estate, a piece of property, a piece of land. But we just say substance as a technical term. Um, Heidegger was interested in the Greek etymology, but he wanted to write a philosophical work without the terminology. He instead used German words, which would also have language speak, okay? And he had terminology to talk about things like, you know, there is a certain um, understanding of being as a as an object, but what about being as something more like disclosure? What about Dasein, German for being there? What if that's more like the clearing in a forest, not the stuff in the clearing, but the clearing itself? And if we understand being as disclosure, does that mean that there's kind of a, a, a fundamental immersion in life world where there's involvements, which are, if there's not a problem ready at hand, you have like the classic example of a hammer, which if there's nothing wrong, the hammer is available for involvement and, and, and use and you're absorbed in using it. You don't even have to think necessarily about it until there's a problem. If the hammer's too heavy to lift, you then stop and as a secondary abstraction from the immersion in life world, then you consider it as an object that's rather than ready at hand, now it's present at hand, and you rationally approach it through the disintegration of that involvement and absorption in life world, and that's where you have like the scientific approach to objects like stopping staring at them, cataloging their properties, etc. But that's merely secondary. And the problem is, for Heidegger, the transition from the ready at hand to the present at hand. It's a bit too ha it's a bit too hasty. What about the vanishing mediator? The problem in being in time is also one of the decision. Um, if Dasein is being towards death, we're all going to die. Nobody can die for you. It's something you have to approach on your own. And you could sort of ignore it and just absorb yourself in Dasman, the stuff that one does, the stuff that everyone does, and try not to think about it. But the difficulty is that if you try to make a, a decision with regard to, to that, um, you can't just theoretically reason out what the best decision will be. You kind of just have to act. This is kind of taking a page from Kierkegaard and the leap of faith. And yet it's also not the superficial notion of having infinite choices and just choosing whatever you want. Um, he considers that kind of like the Americanist fallacy, the kind of the modern consumerist fallacy. Really, it's more like the Protestant notion of grace. In John Calvin's theology, um, God chose you to be the elect but you still have to choose yourself. You still have to choose to be chosen, is what I should say. Um, it's not really a choice, but you still have to choose it. And that's more like what the decision is. Therefore, he, he, he makes kind of the hasty decision of having decision as being uh, ungrounded and therefore falling into fundamental ontology. Um, and um, the question is whether Heidegger's own political problematic involvements with National Socialism, which nobody's ever really been able to provide a satisfactory answer. You have the on the one hand people who say, oh, just don't read him at all because of that. Other people who say, well, he was just um, uh, uh, going along with what others were doing. Really, the idea of, of Heidegger and, um, you know, I don't really want to just start up a whole conversation on that once again, is that when you're dealing with the political closure that Heidegger fell into with regard to the movements of his own time, is that not inherently related to the transcendence of Western subjectivity? Isn't there something in Cartesian subjectivity which opens up the very pathway for democratic resistance to problematic political movements, and the opposite, therefore, would also hold true? 
And therefore, the idea that being in time is at one level complete, but it was abandoned because in that transcendence of Western subjectivity, the idea for Heidegger that the Cartesian stance towards the world is as mind and then body is merely this secondary disintegration of life world that you come with being present, dealing with things as present at hand rather than ready at hand. That argument kind of fell apart when he looked at Kant's transcendental imagination as radically disrupting that model. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of this video. So the first chapter gives a very lengthy and um, impressively technical uh, look at Kant's critique of pure reason for the imagination. Now, that's something which I have a series of videos on the channel that you can look at. I'll just have the very short version of that right now, which is that for Kant, he accepts that, you know, our senses can be impinged upon by stuff out in the world, which provide sort of the raw matter for sense experience. But first, you have to spatially and temporally, I guess, um, filter it trans transcendentally. But even at that level, it's not it's something which has to move through other stages as well. OK, so we all have the understanding and concepts to conceptually understand um, that which we experience out in the world. Uh, but there, the, dif the difficulty is that understanding its concepts, you have like the pure concepts, the categories, you have other concepts as well, uh, is still too different from the sense contents that there has to be another step to provide the smooth flow of experience. And that step is the imagination. Now, Kant says himself, something kind of mysterious happens here. Uh, it's not that you apply the concepts to the the data it, it tells that impinge on your senses, it's more that you apply them to the proto-concepts which the imagination gives you. If you think about the word imagination, it's kind of that uh, in-between space between, you know, rational conceptual understanding and mere data, right, that's impinging on your senses. And for Zizek, the, the funny thing about imagination is it's neither passive receptive nor is it conceptual. It's the gap between the two. This is why the imagination is impossible to place ontologically. It's really something that cannot be fit into the ontology of either of those because it's merely the gap between the two. And therefore, imagination is also impossible to place within the phenomenal and nominal dichotomy in Kant. For Kant, the nominal is the thing in itself, and the phenomenal is the nice flow of experience that you actually experience. Well, where does the imagination fit? You can't say that it fits into the phenomenal because it breaks the chain of causality that the phenomenal is bound by, but it also cannot be placed in the nominal because it's inherently linked to freedom. Imagination is being linked to freedom in the critique of practical reason Kant notes that if you were to just short circuit the um, the uh, phenomenal pathway through which you usually are immersed and go straight to the to the nominal realm, if you were to actually see God, um, you would cease to be able to act freely out of ethical duty. You would become like a puppet because out of pure fear, you would probably still do quote unquote the ethical thing. But it wouldn't be out of duty. It wouldn't be really out of choice, out of freedom. It would simply be out of fear of looking directly at God and eternity, right? And therefore, it cannot be placed in the nominal realm. Uh, and therefore, the funny thing, excuse me, I'll be right back. And therefore, the funny thing about imagination is we usually think of imagination as being like the great unifier, the great source of composition. You take these disparate contents from the sense content realm and you unify them through the, the imagination into something you can apply a concept to. But Zizek is going to argue the opposite. He says that it's more like Hegel's Night of the Pure Self, where you have the disintegration you have at the level of the imagination and freedom, the appearance of these horrifying partial objects. For Hegel's Night of the Pure Self, you have a bloody head here, a ghastly white apparition there, and therefore imagination is not composition but disintegration. This is why the confrontation with the empiricists 
in Kant is actually something other than what we usually think. Um, if you look on page 33 of my edition, um, Kant no longer accepts some pre-synthetic zero-ground elements uh, worked upon by our mind. There's no neutral elementary stuff like John Locke's elementary sensory ideas, which is then composed by our mind. That is, the synthetic activity of our mind is always already at work, even in our most elementary contact with reality. The pre-synthetic real, its pure not-yet-fashioned multitude, is stricto sensu impossible, a level that must be retroactively presupposed but can never be encountered. And therefore, um, the imagination, rather than simply taking stuff that's elementarily um, existing and forming some co composite um, uh, element that can be applied to the concepts, is actually something radically different both at the level of imagination and at the level of that stuff that it's encountering. It's more like a computation with the Lacanian real, right? Rather than being a coherence which is encountered, it is something which is sort of retroactively posited, logically reconstructed, right? And therefore, um, the idea that the, the, the transition from immersion in life world, which even animals have, right? Consider the animal aspect of life world uh, immersion versus the symbolic universe of human meanings as logos is usually thought of speculatively in reconstructions of prehistory as something where there was a, a vanishing mediator between the two, which is called madness. In fact, if you look even at Kant's and, and Hegel's um, interpretations of what might have happened in the prehistory, um, they, they assume there was something like a missing link between animal and man as rational speaking being with logos that was more like pure madness and pure animal instinct. Um, and, well, no, I don't want to say that. It was not pure animal instinct. It was beyond animal instinct. It was pure savagery, but not that as natural savagery of an animal, but rather as the madness, which is neither quite absorption in life world through instinct, nor yet the symbolic logos of rational man. And of course, this vanishing mediator is madness as exactly this gap that he's been talking about this whole time. This is why when you look at someone like Fichte talking about Anstas, um, Anstas as not just uh, the coherent thing in itself out there on the outside, it's rather something that's extimate. It's something which is sort of on the inside, but still always on the outside. And of course, for, um, for Fichte, that is precisely the idea of that which um, forces the subject to have to um, enter into determinacy, but still not something outside the subject. And this is why the problems of epistemology in Kant are really ontological problems. If you look at the sublime in Kant, the inability of the of the imagination to fully catch up with the schematization of, of the sublime, that is really not just a failure epistemologically to, you know, schematize that which is out there. It's rather a an indication that the cosmos it, itself is incomplete. The impossibility of cosmos as a totality is what's signaled to us in the sublime. And therefore, if the cosmos cannot be complete, this means that Hegel is, by showing that the embodiment of the notion always fails, is not showing an epistemological problem of the concept to just capture that which is out there, which is complete. It's rather that that which is out there can never fully be itself. The failure of the embodiment of the notion is not the mind's inability to conceptually capture what is out there. It's rather the stuff out there can't be itself, okay? And therefore, the American appropriation of Heidegger is just like the same as Wittgenstein. When you, if you learn about, if you do learn about Heidegger in an American university, you're probably going to learn the idea of, of Heidegger as someone who's giving us a model of the human person, which is not reducible to AI. Um, we're not just out there processing data like a computer. We're involved in our life world, sort of this cultural anthropological Heidegger appropriated in the American university. But, you know, for Zizek, he says, is it really the case that we're just these beings which are absorbed in life world, or is it rather that the Freudian concept of the unconscious shows some element which is inherently out of joint with life world? Is it the case that the unconscious is just our instinctual absorption in life world, or is it rather that the unconscious goes against um, instinct? It's anti-instinctual. It, it actually leads you to desire to do things that go against the instinctual uh, desire for self-preservation and and survival, really, um, and and therefore the inability to place 
the unconscious um, um, ontologically is related to the inability to place the imagination ontologically. So anyway, this is a great uh, topic, and uh, the next video will be on the Hegelian ticklish subject, and that will be a great discussion, uh, so stay tuned.